they, everything put around. Okay, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. They're right out of here. Yeah, that car and okay. underneath. All right. That's how long it was. Guys, let's, um, pay attention here. Now we recording the video. Yes. Okay. So we should, should Everyone, please silence. be quiet because we do have a video camera going. So, Alan, you get this for, for If you don't know, Alan is a YouTube star. <laughs> I think it's on the internet. <laughs> and if you've seen some of the videos, he's uh, he's posted out to the Yahoo group. They're actually very entertaining and very uh, uh, informative to watch. So, uh, Alan, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, Just been asking me for a while to come in and, and give this talk. Uh, I've given this, this presentation. The first time I gave it was actually about uh, three years ago over at, uh, for the Antique Radio Club over at the Marconi Hotel. And uh, we jokingly called it Scopes for Dopes. Okay? And um, you know, the reason is, is that you know, how many of us have got a scope somewhere in the house? Okay, be honest, how many are afraid to turn it on? <laughs> okay, so I think the paper capacitors might explode. There you yeah. go. So, so the idea here was, you know, when I gave this talk or put this talk together for the Antique Radio Club, you know, I found that you know, most of these guys, they do all this restoration of this old antique radio gear, and they do it with nothing more than an old signal generator and a Simpson 260. You know, and then there's a lot more you can do if you actually turn on the scope that you have there in the shack, too. So, uh, so the idea here is to give you the basics of what an oscilloscope is, I'm always a big fan of, you know, the better you understand how something works, the better off you're going to be able to, better off you're going to be able to drive it. Okay, it's so like if you understand how a manual transmission works, you can drive it better. Okay, you're not going to sit there and ride the clutch on a hill because you know what that's doing to the clutch. So the same thing with the scope. If you understand what it's doing behind the scenes, you better know how to apply the controls and do the thing, do things with it. So we're going to make sure that you, know, you understand what a scope is and how to use it, what the basic controls are. Most of this we're going to talk about with the old analog scopes, because that's what most of us have in the shack. You can pick them up at a ham fest or things like that. Not too many of us have got you know, the nice new digital scopes in the shack, but we'll talk a little bit about that too and compare those. So we'll run through that, and then the second piece of this, we'll talk about a couple of ways you can use a scope in your ham shack, besides the obvious of servicing things and that kind of thing, some other utility that you can get out of a scope in the ham shack. So that's what we're going to run through. Obviously, this, this is for you guys. I'm not up here to listen to myself talk. So if you've got questions or anything like that, something's not clear, let me know, and we'll, we'll try to address that. This is my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash my call sign, W280W. That's the easiest way to get there. I typically put about a video up a week. Okay, I've got almost 170 videos up there now. Just put one up last night on how to make uh, FM deviation measurements with a spectrum analyzer. So some of them are very basic circuit stuff, some of them are oscilloscope or spectrum analyzer related, some of them are ham radio related, so you know, that's kind of the variety of things that I do. Most of my videos are geared towards hobbyists and beginners and that kind of stuff and intended to be kind of educational. So uh, if you have any suggestions for a video you'd like to see, let me know. Okay, so that's how I kind of get my ideas. So with that, just a little bit of history. The oscilloscope was originally, when it was developed, it's called an oscillograph. Basically, and a lot of times it was basically recording variations in signals on film, okay, in many cases. Um, so some of the very early th earliest things that were done in the uh, late 1800s. Uh, it was Sir William Crookes in 1870 discovered this, what they called radiant matter, which later you know, became known as cathode rays. Uh, the first uh, folks to actually apply a cathode ray to actually do some deflection of a beam and actually make an oscilloscope was uh, actually uh, Braun, same guy who makes Braun like razor and stuff today. It's the same founder, the same company. But he used actually magnetic deflection, like TVs, like the old televisions did, uh, where they had a, a, you know, a set of coils around the tube to deflect the beam around. It's magnetic deflection. And this, this Sir John Joseph Thompson in 1897 uh, basically discovered and, and used electrostatic deflection. And actually, it's interesting is that be, by doing that, what he discovered is that the electron beam that's going off to the CRT face is made of electrons, okay, and then by applying a charge, you can deflect that. So in effect, he discovered the electron, okay, as part of this whole process, and was actually credited with discovering the electron. But the electrostatic deflection, where we're actually deflecting a beam based on electric potential, is what uh, all these uh, cathode ray oscilloscopes use. Modern scopes were kind of born in the uh, early 1930s, as Alan, Alan B. Dumont, you know, Jersey Boy Makes Good, 
um, was, was messing around with uh, CRTs in the early 1930s, developed a line of scopes in the mid 30s. Um, and they were used, you know, pretty extensively, especially by the military, especially across the road here at the, the Sigma Core Laboratories, where uh, Howard Ballum actually worked uh, on radar here in the Sigma Core Laboratories. And after the war in 1946, started Tektronics. Uh, yeah. I actually grew up watching the Dumont TV. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Absolutely. And uh, Dumont was a, a big name, and unfortunately, he, he didn't reach the same level of you know prosperity that te Tektronics did. But absolutely, D Dumont was a pretty big name. Okay. So Tektronics, their, their claim to fame was basically making a scope that was calibrated, both in terms of its sweep speed and in amplitude. So you can actually make real measurements as opposed to just watching waveforms. Okay. Whereas Kind of previous scopes were really kind of waveform monitors and they really weren't calibrated in any real way. Okay. So making them calibrated and making a trigger. We'll talk about triggering in a little bit. So a real basic block diagram of a oscilloscope. Okay, you've got a display, okay, and you've got vertical, horizontal, and trigger sections. Okay, so usually the trigger thing when people look at it, I don't understand what that is. That's the most confusing things with scopes. We'll talk a bit about those. And the horizontal and vertical sections are the things that basically control where the beam is on the screen. Okay, think of the, the screen as basically a big etch a sketch. Okay, and we're basically shooting an electron beam to it. We're moving it around based on controls and input signals. So let's talk about how all that works. So the, the, the cathode ray tube itself. You know, this is kind of a, a view if you looked inside this scope. You can kind of see. So it's got a the face of the CRT is. It's got phosphor coating, so when it gets hit with an electron beam, it lights up, it glows. Uh, electron beam is kind of sent out from a gun at the far end of the uh, the far end of the tube over here. It gets passed through, among other things, some deflection plates. The voltage differential on these plates, think of them as like almost like plates of a capacitor. The voltage differential on those plates is going to steer the beam one way or the other, move it up or down, left or right. So there's a set of plates to deflect the beam vertically the set of plates that deflect the beam horizontally. So that we can essentially trace out you know, a pattern on the screen based on the voltages that are applied to those plates. Okay. On the screen itself, you'll see divisions. We can use that to make measurements in time and measurements in voltage. Okay. Alan, yeah. something you may want to explain here is that for those of you who do not use scopes, we refer to um, deflection in the vertical as uh, voltage potential and the deflection on left to right is time. So uh, when people, when you look at an oscilloscope, people say, how do you make a measurement? Well, you know that the, the beam is traveling from left to right, or right to left, you know, the scope side. And that is your sweep speed is your timing. The deflection of the, ver of the signal in a vertical format is your voltage or potential. Yeah, so if you ever used a, you know, even an analog voltmeter, everybody's used an analog voltmeter in the past, right? If you attach a pen to the end of the meter, okay, and probe the signal, and that signal is moving, and you drag a paper across it, you trace out the voltage varies over time. That's really what an oscilloscope does. Okay, it just traces out how voltage is varying over time. And you're dragging that beam across, and the beam being pushed up or down by the voltage that you're measuring. That's what an oscilloscope does. It's really a measure of looking at typically voltage over time. So all of the controls we're going to talk about are how to control and scale things properly and display things properly on the screen. Okay, control you know, how things are being swept and pushed around. Okay. So in the display system, there are some controls that are just geared towards the display system itself. Okay. So this controls very basic features like brightness, focus, etc. You know, on, on the scope. So you'll see, you know, you'll, you'll have a brightness control, which is obvious in terms of mixing the screen brighter or dimmer. There's a, uh, a focus control to sharpen up the trace to make it nice and thin. Okay. There's an intensity control we talked about. Um, there'll also be uh, what's called a beam finder. You might have seen this on a scope. What's that beam finder button? Well, oftentimes you might have the scope misadjusted and the, and the trace is off the screen somewhere. Okay. So the way to find it is you push that beam finder button, and what it does is it collapses all the deflection voltages so that even if the thing is way off the screen, it kind of puts it on the screen so you can see it. And then you can use some controls to kind of position it and get it where you want. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a zoom out. Show me where that trace is so I can put it back on the screen again. Okay. 
that's what the beam finder is. There will also be a trace rotation control because we are using magnetic deflection. So depending on where you put the scope and what magnetic fields might be in the area, it might cause the trace to tilt one way or the other. So the trace rotation basically flattens that out, nulls that out. So if you move the, move the scope on your bench, you might have to go twist that again to kind of flatten your trace out. Yeah. What is trace? The, the trace is the, the pattern you're going to see on the scope string. Okay, so the line that's, that's, that's portrayed on the scope, you can see I've got a horizontal trace on my scope string here. Thank that's what, when I talk about trace or waveform, I'm referring to the pattern on the face of the CRT. Okay. So if you use spectrum analyzers, they're typically called traces on the scopes, are called waveforms, but we'll use those terms interchangeably. Okay. So any, if, you, well, if you look at your scope, you'll see these controls for focus, intensity, trace rotation, beam finder. Those are just controlling you know, how bright and how clear and where you know, on that scope screen that trace is going to appear. So the next system we'll talk about is the vertical system. The vertical system is what basically takes the signal that we want to look at. Okay, maybe it's connecting up to a radio, radio or a probing inside of a circuit somewhere or something like that. That's the voltage we want to see, okay, that we're trying to learn something about or measure. So it's kind of like the same thing as it's like the leads for your voltmeter. Okay, we'll have a probe to the scope to do that. So the idea is that signal that we want to look at, we want to be able to trace out you know, on the scope screen so we can actually see what's going on. Remember, voltage in the vertical axis, time going along here, so we're dragging the, the beam across and just tracing out voltage changes over time. So we need to kind of get things scaled and adjusted right so that our signal's not really tiny or not huge. We want it to scale appropriately on the screen. So that's what the vertical controls do. Uh, the vertical front end of a scope is kind of built this way. There is a variable attenuator and a preamp. You might say, well, why don't I just make a variable gain amplifier? Well, it would seem to be simple, right? The reason for this is, and if you're familiar, like if you're all ham radio operators, we're familiar with a superheterodyne type of receiver or transmitter. Why do we do that? We use superheterodyne because if you did, if, otherwise, you did, if you didn't have to use superheterodyne, you'd have to do like a tuned front end or tuned amplifiers. Like if you want to go from 10 meters to 40 meters, you'd have to tune all these amplifiers and filters you know, to those various frequencies, okay? That's a very difficult thing to do. So we use superheterodyne to basically mix up, mix and convert from one frequency to another so that all of our filtering, <coughs> all of our amplification, all of that kind of stuff is done in an IF, intermediate frequency. So I don't have to tune those things around. I can optimize that stuff and just use some local oscillators to kind of translate frequency back and forth. So we can get a much better design by and much better filtering and things like that by using that common IF. For the same reason, we use a, a fixed preamp here. This preamp is fixed in gain, so its gain characteristic, its offset, its noise is all kind of optimized. So to adjust the gain from our input signal to the scope screen, we basically adjust the signal level going into the preamp. Okay, so the preamp is kind of fixed. So that's why sometimes on the scopes you'll see the vertical control says vertical attenuator setting. Okay, and what that's doing is adjusting the signal level into this fixed gain preamp. Okay, that is then going ahead and drive the vertical deflection plates on the scope. Okay, so we'll talk about some of these controls. There's controls for coupling and the sensitivity or volts per division. We'll talk about that. These two here, position and mode. Um, position basically is just adjusting the position of that trace vertically you know, on the scope screen. So if you want to put multiple traces up, you might want to position them and separate them out so you can see them. Okay. We'll talk about mode here in a moment as well. Okay. So let's take a closer look at uh, some of these controls. Is this all clear so far? Everybody here? No snoring, we're good. So I, I put some pictures up here of what, it might, what these controls might look like on various scopes. So depending on what scope you've got available, you can recognize it. Um, so the, the vertical sensitivity of the scope, how many volts does it take to you know, create a waveform here, is, control, is controlled by you know, this volts per division control. <coughs> so when, when this one here is set to 0.5 volts per division, that means if I apply a half a volt to the input of the scope, I'm going to move one division okay, on the scope screen. Okay, when it's set to, and if I apply a volt to it, then I go two divisions. Okay, so it's, it's how many volts per division. So it's like how many, how many S units on an S meter. It's how many volts per division on the scope screen. 
So that's what that volts per division control is. And you'll see sometimes it'll, you know, they'll, be, they'll look a little bit different, but that's basically what they are, they're all kind of that vertical sensitivity. And it's really just adjusting that vertical attenuator. Okay. On some of the older, really older scopes um, that weren't calibrated, oftentimes you might just see a vertical input attenuator and a variable gain. These are not calibrated. Okay, not going to be able to get a given number of volts per division unless you set this up, put a known signal in, and then if you don't touch the settings, then it's calibrated you know, based on that. But there's almost no excuse for using these really old, you know, kind of service grade scopes anymore because there's a large variety of really good lab based scopes that are available, you know, you can use market now for $100 or less that uh, you'd be much better off using. Okay, so that's what the vertical scale control is. You'll also see a coupling control, okay, AC or DC coupling. So you AC or DC coupling here, okay, AC or DC coupling. Oh, okay. And what that does is when we're sending the signal in, we're either going to directly couple, DC couple, right to the scope screen, or we're going to throw a capacitor in series. The capacitor in series will be a relatively large value capacitor, so anything more than, you know, 10 or 20 hertz will pass through it fine, but it blocks the DC. So why would we want to use that? Let's say, for example, you wanted to look at power supply ripple. I have a 13.8 volt power supply, okay? So, okay, I need to set probably, you know, maybe two volts of division, okay? So I can get, you know, I can see from ground up to my 13.8 without being off the top of the screen. And if I do that, I have a two volts of division, if my ripple is only 100 milliamps, it's gonna be really tiny riding on top of this big DC level. But if I AC couple, I can essentially remove the DC, okay, and then turn my sensitivity up and be able to look at that ripple, you know, maybe at 100 millivolts of division or you know, 50 millivolts of division. So AC or DC coupling doesn't necessarily have to match up whether we're looking at an AC or DC signal. It just determines how we're what, how we're processing that signal in that front end. So if you're looking at a small signal that's riding on top of a large DC, AC coupling can help you. Okay, to be able to see and expand the scale around that. Because if I, if I was DC coupled, I'd say, okay, I need to look at 100 millivolts of division. Well, I'll, I'll start cranking up my sensitivity, and then the, the signal goes off the screen, I'll bring my position down, and I'll do it again, it goes off the screen again, I'll bring my position down, eventually you run out of position. You can't move it down anymore. The AC coupling just pulls that DC out of it. Make sense? Okay. So that's what the AC and DC coupling are. The other thing you might want to take a note of is that also printed on the front panel of the scope is the input impedance. And in almost all cases, the input impedance of the scope, okay, is one megawatt. And it's going to be shunted by some value, some, some small capacitance value, 15 picofarads, 18 picofarads, 25 picofarads, something in that neighborhood. It's typically the input capacitance of the scope. So one mega and 15 picofarads, a very typical thing. We're going to have to know about this a little bit later on. But what that means is just like you know, like your, your, your handheld, if you got a DMM, most of them are 10 mega ohm input impedance. And the idea is that a very large input impedance means that it's not going to load down the circuit when you go, you know, attach, attach it to your circuit. That's the same reason why we've got a one mega ohm input impedance here on the scope. Okay. Some higher speed scopes will have the option of terminating this line instead of in one mega ohm, but into 50 ohms. And typically, it's for scopes that are 100 megahertz bandwidth or higher will give you that option. For the cases where you need to terminate a line, 50 ohms. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Everybody clear on this? Okay. Now, yeah. Is there something there to protect the scope in case you put too high of a voltage in? Uh, there's two things. Usually, the scope will have some maximum rating, you know, 400 volts, you know, peak in, in this particular case. So there is protected for that. Uh, the other thing that's there, it's right here. Here's common sense. Okay. <coughs> You're going to be hooking up to some unknown signal turn your volts per division up to some large value, okay? Maybe to 10 volts of division, <coughs> then hook up to it. If you can't see your signal, then start cranking down on it, okay? Just like, you know, if you're gonna hook up to an antenna, you might not start off with the preamp on and all that kind of stuff. You wanna do the same thing here. Just so use your okay, sense. can you damage the scope? You potentially could. I mean, if you exceed the values here, you could damage the front end, yes, okay? And also, when you're fine with the, the or if I connect up to, or I set the termination to 50 ohm, you'll notice down here, the 50 ohm is only rated for 5 volts RMS. Right? So can I hook my transmitter, my, my transmitter right up to this? You can pay it's 50 ohms, it's a dummy load, right? Uh, it can't take that kind of power. Okay? So the, the, 
values and stuff that are printed on the front panel are there for a reason. Okay, to use the common sense we look at. Okay, it's not going to protect you against everything. Okay. So let's talk about vertical moves. Okay, so we got our signal coming in. Vertical moves. You'll see the various mood controls, channel one, channel two, you'll see channel one, channel two, channel, this is a four channel scope, so there's four channels we can turn on or off. And of course as we add channels, we add we're adding additional traces okay, that we can go look at. Um, but let's say I want to look at, well, let's, let's back up a little bit. When I add multiple traces, most of these scopes these days are what are called single beam scopes. There's only one electron beam. How do I display two waveforms at the same time? Okay, with one electron beam. All right. So in order to do that, we use one of these two modes, an alt mode or a chop mode. Okay. So what alt does is says, well, okay, I'm going to send one trace. It's going to be channel one. The next trace that comes along is going to be channel two. Then I'll send channel one. Then I'll send channel two. And if the sweep speed is fast enough, okay, you don't see the flicker back and forth between those two. It just looks like two continuous traces. Okay, so that's what the alt mode does, is literally flips back and forth, one trace, alternating back and forth between two traces, three traces, four traces. Okay? But let's say we're looking at relatively slow signals, slowly varying signals, like even audio signals, you might want to look at one or two milliseconds of division, you'll start to see the flicker back and forth between these two traces. So then there's a mode called chop. Okay, so what the chop mode allows you to do is rather than switch back and forth alternating between traces, during a particular trace as it's going across, it's flipping back and forth between those two inputs. And it's doing it so fast at about a one megahertz rate or 100 kilohertz rate somewhere in that region that you can't see it. So again, your eye looks like it's just seeing two continuous traces, but it's literally flipping back and forth very quickly. So the chop mode is useful for looking at multiple traces when your sweep speed is slow. And the alt mode is useful for looking at multiple traces when your sweep speed is fast. And the way you tell is just visually looking at it. Okay. Oh, that looks like it's bouncing back and forth when we switch to chop mode. Okay, go back and forth. So that's what those two are. Okay. There's also an add mode, and that would basically allow you to take channel one and add it to the multiple channel two and look at the sum. Not really useful in a lot of cases, but where it becomes really useful is when you also add in something called an invert. So oftentimes there's an invert control for channel two. Okay, so now if I take channel one and add it to the inverse of channel two, what's that? That's the difference, right? So it's channel one minus channel two. Now why is that useful? If we think about using a voltmeter, you can basically take the two probes of a voltmeter and stick it across any component, okay? So it doesn't matter where ground is or anything else, you're just measuring the voltage across that component. Okay, a scope is different. The scope input is always referenced to ground. Okay, so I can't just take the scope probe and put one lead arbitrarily anywhere and then the other the probe anywhere else because one half of that scope probe lead is ground. So anywhere you connect it should be ground. So let's say I want to measure the voltage across some component. Okay, I can't just put the scope probe across it. But what I do is I put one scope probe on one side, the other scope probe on the other side, and then add an invert. That'll subtract those two and essentially show you the voltage across that component. So it's a way of making effectively a kind of floating or differential <coughs> using the add and input controls. So that's what they are. Most of the time, if you don't need it, it's moth. Okay? But that's what the vertical mode controls are on the scope. And again, no matter what the scope looks like, you'll see you know, those controls on there. Okay? Make sense? Yes. So let's talk about the horizontal system. So we got the vertical system down. And on the scope, the vertical controls will all typically be all grouped together. Now the horizontal controls are typically where is something completely generated internal to the scope. Okay, because the vertical input is where we're putting our signal in to look at. The horizontal section controlling you know, how fast we're moving the beam across the screen is controlled essentially all in the scope. And it's controlled with what's called the horizontal time base. Okay. So there's an amplifier that's going to basically push you know, that beam back and forth on the screen, it basically pushes it across, blanks it out, brings it back, pushes it across again, retraces again, kind of like the TVs work. Okay. There is a sweep generator, which basically controls how fast we sweep that beam across the screen. That's why it's called a sweep. Okay, we're just moving that beam across the screen. We can move it slowly, kind of like a heartbeat monitor in the hospital. Okay? Or we can move it fast. We're looking at fast signals like RF and things like that. So the sweep generator controls that. 
and it's got controls for instead of volts per division like vertical, it's so many, it's time per division, like seconds per division, milliseconds of division, microseconds of division, nanoseconds of division. Okay. There's also a couple of other controls that we'll talk about here, like mode controls and things like that. But they control essentially how fast we move that, that sweep across the screen, how much we're going to stretch out that voltage variation over time. Okay? Because if you've got a voltage that's varying over time, up or down, the faster we move the sweep, the more that signal gets stretched out like it was on Play-Doh. So that's what just the sweep generator does. Okay. Now, unfortunately, on the new scopes these days, or new digital scopes, it's not called a time base because the new scopes are just digitally sampling things. So oftentimes, that control, instead of being called a time base or uh, control or sweep control, it's called a horizontal scale. Because that's really all it is. Okay. So let's talk about sweeping. Um, yeah. On the previous screen, do you have on the dual trace? We do have two sweep generators or one. I'm sorry. On on the on, when you have when you have it set up for a dual trace, mm -hmm. would each trace have its own sweep generator, or are they always locked on, in? On a single beam scope, which is the vast majority of what's out there, the sweep speed is constant on both traces. Okay. There are ways uh, of having this scope, and a lot of them will have dual time bases. Okay. And what you can do is say have have a you know a sweep go across at one time base, and then have a with a delayed sweep or a uh, expanded sweep that can take a portion of that waveform and zoom it out. So you can have two traces that are alternating between slow and fast to magnify a certain portion of the waveform. I've got this waveform here. Let me take that section of it and blow it up down here. Okay. So that is possible. Yeah. Uh, dual trace. Would you consider that almost like having uh, two oscilloscopes in one box? Yeah, exactly. Because there are two. Because people will look at this and call this a four trace or you know, uh, scope, even though it's a single trace scope. There were scopes that actually had two electron guns, and they were typically called dual beam oscilloscopes to kind of differentiate them a little bit. And yeah, in those that cases, you really it was almost like having two scopes that were sharing a display. Yeah, because I had a, a, a dual trace uh, a scope, and I used it to compare, uh, say, the outputs coming on uh, two different boards. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the boards are functionally the same. Right. But if I have one I know is brand new, mm -hmm. and I have put the output on the scope, and mm -hmm. I know another one is giving me a little heat heat, mm -hmm. I look at the, the signal coming out. Yeah. If they're, you know, different, I know right. there's a problem. There. Yeah, that doesn't have to be done with, with a dual beam scope. It can be done with a scope like this, just alternating back right. and forth between the two. So that's dual trace, even though it's a single time base. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the controls. Let's talk about sweeping in general. Uh, there were kind of two, the early scopes were what were called recurrent sweep scopes. Um, and remember we said we're moving that and steering that beam by changing the voltage on the deflection plates. So the higher the voltage, the more we're going to steer the beam one way or the other. The polarity tells it which way it's going to go. So if you, th if you think about it, if you basically apply a triangular wave shape to the deflection plate, you're going to push the beam across one, you know, from one side of the screen to the other, then flip back to the other end again, push it across one side to the other. So you have this sawtooth waveform that basically drives the beam across the screen. Okay? So this might be the far left of the screen, that's the far right of the screen. Okay? So the older scopes were called recurrent sweep. They just had this sawtooth waveform that you adjusted the frequency on to control how fast it was moving. Now the problem with that is that they were generally uncalibrated. And there wasn't really a way to stabilize a waveform because now the waveform that you're putting in and the sweep speed were kind of unrelated to each other. Okay, and the waveform will roll back and forth and things like that. And there was a sync control that would try to injection lock a, a harmonic and your input signal to the horizontal oscillator to try to get the thing stable and it worked kind of lousy. Now, again, these were scopes that you know, were inexpensive and were pretty popular in the service industry, but again, nowadays, you can get a trigger sweep scope for you know, a really decent price. There's almost no excuse for using this. The reason I bring it up is that if you look at if you pick up, you see a scope and say, it's got a frequency vernier and horizontal frequency range, and it doesn't have a time per division control on it, that's your dead giveaway that is a recurrent sweep scope, and look elsewhere and get a nice trigger sweep scope. The triggered sweep scope, what it does, it also has a ramp waveform that controls the position and moves the position of the beam across the screen. But that ramp is based, is basically started off and controlled 
by a trigger circuit. So that that trigger circuit can say, when the waveform does this, then send the beam across. So it allows you to synchronize the sweep to your waveform. Okay. And the trigger sweep scope will always have a calibrated sweep time per division you know, control on it. So that should give a little, you know, I would say run away from these guys, you're going to get a scope, get something that's a triggered sweep scope. It won't say it's triggered sweep, but the fact that it's got a calibrated time per division control, horizontal control, is your giveaway that it, uh, that it is a triggered sweep type scope. Okay. Some other controls, triggering. Okay. Everybody kind of clear though on the uh, on horizontal controls that we're controlling how fast we're moving that beam across, how fast we're stretching the waveform. The next thing I want to talk about is triggering. Okay. Remember I said that the trigger sweep scopes are going to basically initiate that sweep based on some trigger, like pulling the trigger of a gun. Okay. So why do we want to do that? Because what it does, it helps us to stabilize the waveform. So uh, you remember when, when these things are working, they're working because I'm sending sometimes dozens, hundreds, even thousands of sweeps a second, and they're all laying on top of each other, and that's why the phosphor is glowing, and I can actually see what the waveform looks like. You know, most of these scopes don't have the writing rate that if you just had one sweep, you wouldn't really see it because it just disappears too quick. So we're relying on the fact that we're sending multiple <coughs> sweeps. So we want each of those sweeps to kind of sh show the waveform in the same way so all those traces lie on top of each other and blow the phosphor. So the way we do that is to use a trigger. So let's say my waveform looks like this. If we set start the sweep at the same location and time for each cycle of the waveform, all of those waveforms that get traced out on the scope trace will on the scope face will all lay on top of each other. And if they lay on top of each other, now they glow and you can see them and you, you see the waveform. So the trigger control is basically what makes that happen. Okay. So again, those old recurrent sweep scopes had a sync control. You see the sync on the scope, the sync selector, we'll run away from that, but we get that, pick up a trigger sweep scope. And, uh, Again, the horizontal time-based control is your giveaway. So but the, the function of both of these things is to ensure that we're kicking off the sweep at the right time on the waveform. So there's some, some controls that we're going to talk about that control how that happens. Okay. So the trigger source. What do we want to trigger on? What do we want this trigger, trigger thing to fire on? Your index finger, what portion of the waveform, whatever it might be. Okay. So it's typically, so the sources could be internal. An internal source means that I'm going to be looking at, say, the vertical signal, the signal I'm applying to the vertical channel, I'll take a piece of that, and then based on some characteristic of that trigger, based on that. That's most of the time what you'd be using as an internal trigger. There is an external trigger control, external trigger setting, and that says that I might have another input on the scope that I'm going to bring in a signal, and that's going to be my trigger source, okay, versus the other signal that I'm looking at. A line trigger basically triggers on a 60 hertz line frequency. Okay, so if you're working on a, like a synchronous power supply or something that has that's related to the 60 hertz that's on the, on the wall outlet, you can trigger based on that, so you can actually see the waveform stable with respect to that. So that's what the source is, right? Trigger mode. Okay, so just like we have vertical modes for setting vertical, there are some modes for trigger. Um, and the auto trigger mode is probably the most common thing that we'll use. And what the auto mode does, it doesn't automatically set up a trigger. And I think that's what it does, but that's not what it does. What the auto trigger mode does is say, if I set these trigger controls to look for some characteristic of a waveform to trigger on, um, if a valid trigger event doesn't happen, right, I don't meet those criteria, periodically, every 50 milliseconds or so, I'm going to send a trace anywhere. Okay, and so that what's helpful is that let's say I'm probing around on a circuit, I don't know what these waveforms are going to look like, so I might not be able to get the trigger set right, but I want to see a waveform on my screen, okay, until I get it set right, all right, because otherwise if you go to what's called normal trigger mode, that sweep doesn't start until you get a valid trigger. So if you put a, a probe down on a portion of the circuit and you don't have the trigger control set right, the scope screen is black. It doesn't give you much information. So the auto mode will kind of time out and say, okay, I've waited long enough, I'm going to send a, a trace anyway. So by doing that, now you can see a trace and you might be able to see, oh, it's way up here or it's moving or whatever, and then you can quickly adjust your trigger controls to stabilize that waveform. 
So that's what the auto trigger mode does. It's not an automatic <coughs> setting. It's just a way of giving you some feedback so you can look at the screen and see what's going on. A single trigger is what you might expect. You set it up, you reset it, it triggers once, boom, it's done, until you reset it again. And that was typically used, you know, would often be used with, you know, like a digital camera, like a, a digital camera, an old Polaroid scope camera to capture a single event, okay? If you might imagine there may be some single event things in the military that you know, they don't happen once and then they don't exist anymore. That was a way of capturing events like that. Also, you'll see sometimes TV trigger modes, and these were common in scopes that were used for television servicing that could trigger on the vertical or horizontal sync pulses out of a video signal. Okay. Uh, so that's what that would mean. But 90% of the time, you can use an internal trigger and start off with a trigger mode. Trigger coupling. Just like we had coupling on the vertical controls, okay, to an AC or DC couple, we can AC or DC couple the signal into the trigger circuit to remove a DC component or not. There's often other things like high frequency reject, noise reject, things like that, that might help you to condition the signal that's going into the trigger circuit. Okay. These are some of the typical controls you'd see. In most cases, you're gonna do internal trigger, auto, and either AC or DC, depending on what your signal is doing. Okay. Are the most common things that you apply. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of these controls. The two most common ones are level and slope. Because most of these analog scopes are designed to trigger when the voltage crosses a threshold. Okay, you set a voltage threshold, if the voltage crosses that, then I, then I set the speaker close. It's as simple as that. Okay, so the level that we're going to trigger on is simply a triggering level control. Okay, so that's the threshold voltage that, that when the input signal I've got coming in crosses that threshold, boom, send the sweep to that. So now the sweeps all start at that same voltage level. Okay. So here's, here's an example of moving that back and forth. When I've got it adjusted kind of out of the positive side of things, above zero, I can see I'm starting to trigger on this sine wave waveform above ground right here. Okay. If I adjusted that control down below ground, now I'm start, starting that waveform down at the bottom. I'm setting that voltage threshold that when the voltage crosses that, that's when I, I send the trigger. So basically, you want this thing adjusted somewhere within the peak peak excursion of your waveform. Okay, if it's above it or below it, you never cross it, and you won't get a sweep. Okay, unless you're in auto mode and sending it automatically. And that's the whole idea. In auto trigger mode, you might see the waveform is unsynchronized, and then you might say, "Oh, I need to move my trigger level up to here." Now it's stabilized. The waveform is now triggering on it. Okay. The slope control basically says, "Okay, there's my threshold." But in which direction do I have to cross it? Okay, do I have to come up from below and cross it that way and trigger then? Or do I want it to trigger when I drop below that level? Okay, that's a positive or negative slope. So again, we kind of see those differences here. So triggering the positive slope, I'm triggering at that level when the voltage is rising through it, okay, on the side. Okay, the slope when it's in the negative position basically says I'm gonna trigger on that same voltage level but now only when I'm dropping down from above it and going through it that way. Okay, so I can see the difference here when I switch the slope to positive or negative, the effect on what that waveform is going to look like. The same waveform that's going in in both cases, we're just changing the starting point and where I'm triggering on that. So, so I've got the threshold set high, triggering on the positive slope or the negative slope, or here I've got the threshold set low, okay, below ground, and I'm triggering on the positive slope as I'm going above it, or the negative slope as I'm going down through it that way. So these are the two most common controls on the trigger that you're going to use, and that's what their function is. Everybody good on that? Okay. Now one nice thing that Tektronix did with uh, a lot of their older analog scopes, especially the ones that had the knot, the, the buttons and the slide switches that were, were moved up or down, mm -hmm. is that the mode control, the uh, trigger slope, or all these other various controls that you might want to have right. If you push all those knobs to the top, you're in auto trigger mode, AC coupling, you know, positive slope, ready to go. Okay, so just kind of a shortcut that push all those buttons up to the top. Okay, it's like turning them all, turn them all up to the left. Right, so turn, push all those knobs up to the top and, and get the, and basically the trigger will basically work for really give you a good starting point. Okay, make sense? That's the basic three groups of controls.
right? Control the vertical. How sensitive do we need to make the scope to look at it? How fast do we want the sweep to go? How much do we need to stretch that waveform out to actually see it so it's not compressed or stretched out too far? Okay. And then, you know, how do we start the waveform to synchronize on it? And once you understand those controls, you can drive your scope. It's easy. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between uh, analog and digital scopes. So these analog CRT-based scopes are what we've been talking about thus far, like the one I've got here. Okay. Digital scopes work a little differently. Uh, conceptually, they're actually simpler. Uh, it's kind of like the input of a sound card, if you will. You put an analog signal in, it goes through to an analog to digital converter, which basically takes snapshots of that waveform over time, okay, at some sample rate, puts all those snapshots in memory, and then from that, those samples in memory, kind of like a motion picture, it goes and displays a picture of that waveform on the screen. Okay. So there's things like a record length, which is how many samples it can store. You know, for that waveform to show you. There's a sample rate, okay, how fast am I going to take snapshots of that voltage you know, to go look at, all right? Uh, and of course, there's no time scale anymore, right? The only time scale is really how fast I can sample things, but it really is just a horizontal scale, how much I want to zoom that waveform back and forth. It's just a picture, a representation of that. So sample rate is typically measured <coughs> by samples per second. You know, I might, or I might operate at you know, 500 mega samples per second, or. 100 giga sample per second, depending on you know, the scope that you're dealing with. Okay. So, so that's the biggest difference in terms of how waveforms are acquired and displayed. This is always live. There's no storage here unless there were some storage CRTs where the phosphor could get written and it would stay there and glow for a while, and then would sometimes bloom out and get reset. And so that was the only storage unit that we had on analog scopes other than taking a photograph of it. And there were, who remembers the old Polaroid scope cameras? Okay, that you used to, in fact, if you look at the scope, there's a little bit of a, a rail here, a, a slot, and the scope camera just decided to hang right on that slot, and just cover over the whole CRT, you put a, a Polaroid photo pack in the back of it, and then you adjust controls and expose it, or maybe do a single shot to capture a single trace, and pull the film out, peel it off, and it would all fold up on you, and you have to strap, straighten it out, and you had a photograph of the trace. That's, that was your storage scope back then, okay? Here, since we're storing things electronically, we can export those files, we can do all kinds of things with it. Yeah. I was a, a little bit more new school than that. I have a, uh, a scope manufactured by one of your competitors that actually has a built-in thermal <coughs> printer. Okay, there you go. <laughs> LaCroix had that, yes. Phillips, actually. Oh, Phillips had it too? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but I remember when I, when I got out of college in 1985, you know, we didn't have digital scopes yet, and we, we, had, these, we had these scopes, the digital cap with these full Polaroid cameras, and one of the rites of passage is someone would come up to you with that scope camera, you go right in your face and take a picture. Okay, so hanging up on the wall were all these little curly black and white photographs of everybody's nose. When you get up. <laughs> that was that was kind of the you know who worked in the lab. So, so that's what one of the differences is in terms of the architecture. So the block diagram kind of described: we still have an input front end, analog to digital converter, and then we process all those samples. They get stuck into memory like a computer. And then there was some processing on that to display. So there's no sweep controls, things like that. There are trigger controls now, but the triggers don't really kick off a sweep anymore. The trigger is basically used as a marker and says, this is the data I want to keep in memory. Okay, because the scope is sampling all the time. And it's usually sampling and throwing those samples away. Until it gets a trigger and says, oh, I'm going to keep this section. I'll display that for you. So, that, so the trigger is more used as, you know, a a marker to say, this is what I want to capture, as opposed to synchronizing a waveform. Okay, it still does synchronize the waveform, but it's doing it by, pick, by saving the right section of data. Uh, just for those who haven't worked with scopes, uh, when you're working, when you're talking analog scope, digital scope, an analog scope can easily take digital signal. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, talk, we're not talking about what the signals that are going into the scope. It means you can put a digital signal in or an analog signal in into the, uh, the old type right. text scope, no problem. Yeah. The key thing with regards to the digital one, for them, uh, fundamentally, is that you can uh, store that right. sample, right. especially if you're looking for an anomaly where, where mm -hmm. the, the signal is fine and then you get a glitch or something. You get a glitch 
Uh, you can't do that on an analog scope, but on a digital scope, you run the signal for X number of times, and then you look at the, the memory of it. Exactly right. there. Just like when we talked about the vertical controls, you got AC <coughs> and DC coupling. That doesn't mean that I use AC coupling for AC signals and DC coupling for DC signals, right? You use what's appropriate, right? An analog or digital scope just refers to how it's processing the data. Both of them could be used for analog or digital signals. Okay. So some things that the digital scope gives you is that because I've got this, this data stored electronically, okay, waveform stored, we can do things like zooming in on a waveform, I can capture and store waveforms, I can get pre-trigger information. Right? I can look at a portion of waveform before the trigger occurred. Right? Looking, you know, before something happens. You can't really do that on an analog scope because the trigger kicks off the sweep. So you can't see what happened before. But because the digital scope is sampling all the time, you might say sample all the time, sample, sample, sample. When the trigger comes along, I'm going to save from here out to there. Okay, so I can save from information that happened before the trigger occurred. Because all this data is kind of pushed into this buffer, this pipeline. And I'll decide how much of that pipeline I want to save. So you can actually get some pre-trigger information. Lots more triggering capability as opposed to just triggering on the rising or falling edge of a signal at some level. So there's lots of other ways of triggering on signals. Uh, we won't even get into all the details of that. And a lot of automatic measurements. Automatically measure rise time, fall time, frequency, amplitude, period, things like this of the waveform. So lots of capability when you get into the modern digital scopes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's more of a microprocessor than I mean, it's a computer than it is a... Exactly. It's an A to D converter, put the stuff in memory after that, it's all processed. Right. Now we use uh, a combination of analog and digital in my job, mm -hmm. and I have to keep both because I don't care whose scope it is, uh, I don't care who the manufacturer is, digital scopes don't re react as fast as an analog scope. Mm -hmm. And there have been times where I've actually stood there and watched a power supply explode uh, but a signal was still on the screen a second and a half later. <laughs> so I got kind of, you know, it, it's a new concept to some of the new techs, you know, you know, this isn't happening in real time, this is happening a second and a half after the event. Okay. So when we do setups, I always tell them, use the analog scope because if something's going wrong, you're going to see it. Mm -hmm. And you can take steps to stop something from happening. Yeah. Once you get something stable, the digital scope, far outweighs uh, up measures the analog scope and its capabilities and I tell everybody switch over to the analog and do your calibrations. So you know, a lot of other things that we can do, we can do waveform math. We did the when we talked about doing add and invert. We can do a lot more waveform math. You can add more waveforms, multiply waveforms, divide waveforms, do all kinds of interesting things with waveform math because it's all just numbers at this point that in the computer effectively. You can do FFTs, fast Fourier transforms, to look at the frequency content, turn your scope into a spectrum analyzer. Okay. Uh, and so lots of other, you know, here's some measurements you know, on the waveform here, cycle RMS measurement, peak to peak voltage measurements, things like that. So lots of things that the digital scope gives you. And, uh, and you can get some digital scopes fairly inexpensively these days, a couple hundred bucks. Okay. Some of the Chinese manufacturers. So, uh, so that's kind of the biggest difference. If you're going to be doing some work in RF, I'd recommend picking up an old analog scope. The reason, one of the reasons for that is when we're looking at an RF signal, oftentimes we might want to look at the modulated RF envelope, like a station monitor. So you might be you know, operating at 14, you know, on 14 megahertz, okay, but you're going to slow the sweep speed way down to look at the envelope of the RF. And you might be looking at one or two milliseconds of division. At that speed, you can't see the RF carrier, it just looks like a big fuzzball. Okay? But you can see the modulated RF output. We're going to do that in a little bit. If you do that on a digital scope, what happens is the sample rate gets turned down to the point where you start aliasing the waveform. So what I mean by that is, who likes old Western movies? Right? You watch the old Western movies and you look at the, the wagon wheels and sometimes they look like they're stopped or turning backwards. Right? That's because when the motion picture was effectively sampling the position of the, of the wheel, as the wheel's spinning around, sometimes it sampled it, sampled it, sampled it, and it looked like pictures make it look like the wheel's going backwards because it's not sampling it as fast as the wheel's turning around. The same thing happens on a digital scope. If you don't sample the waveform fast enough, it can alias and look like something else. So a digital scope, you try to slow things down, look at an RF waveform, all of a sudden you'll see a sinusoid at a different frequency. What is that? Okay, now a scope will never do that. Okay. So 
some of the, the you know, comparison with the analog and digital scope. So regardless of what you're using, you're going to have to get the signals into the scope. Okay? Oftentimes you're using proofs. Okay? Like I've got one right here. That's kind of what they look like, right? Okay. Now, that's a way of basically connecting a signal, getting it into the scope. The goal is to get the signal into the scope and minimize any loading effects. You don't want to affect the circuit you're looking at, right? You don't, want, you don't want to disturb its operation or anything like that. You want to kind of probe it in a kind of a non-invasive way. That's what the probes are designed to do. The most common probes are passive, what are called 1x and 10x probes. Okay? A 1x probe is literally basically like a direct connection to the scope front end. A 10x probe does a 10x attenuation of the signal. And I said, well, why do I want to do that? I'll show you a couple of reasons why we want to do that, why 10x probes are really the most common thing. There are also a lot of other specialist probes, high voltage, high voltage probes, differential probes, active probes, current probes, things like that, different ways of getting different signals into your scope. So let's talk a bit more about 1x and 10x probes and why there are 10x probes in the first place. Okay. So again, 1x probes is really, again, a direct connection to the scope input the problem is that they can have excessive capacitive loading. Remember we looked at the scope input impedance before, it was one mega ohm shunted by how much capacitance? 15 picofarads, something like that. Well, 15 picofarads at 30, you know, on, at 10 meters is, is less than 100 ohms of impedance, right? So no longer does the scope input look like a high impedance if you're trying to probe a circuit that's operating at 28, 27 megahertz, 28 megahertz, right? So what do we do about that? Uh, well, uh, well, well, the other thing you have to worry about, too, is that the probe is connected to its coax. So you got another 15 picofarads per foot on the coax, okay? So by the time you get the probe to your circuit, you know, the 15 or 20 picofarads of the scope and the probe capacitance, you're talking 100 picofarads just sticking on, the, on, the, on your circuit. Will your circuit like having, you know, 100 picofarads connected at that spot? Maybe not, okay? That's why 1x probes are really only good for low frequency signals and things like that. Okay. So oftentimes we'll use 10x probes. And what 10x probes do is right at the input of the scope, or right at the input of the probe, way down at this end that I'm going to connect up to my circuit, there's a 9 mega ohm resistor in the series with the scope. So that 9 mega ohm resistor and then the 1 mega ohm impedance of the scope makes a 10x voltage divide. Okay. So it, well, what it does is, since that 9 mega ohm resistance appears before the scope capacitance, it kind of puts the scope capacitance and the probe capacitance on the other side of 9 mega ohms. So the circuit doesn't see it anymore. Okay, so now I don't have the capacitive loading. Great. I killed the signal amplitude by a factor of 10, but we can deal with that. Okay. So the good thing is it reduces the effect of the capacitive loading. The bad thing, also, it needs compensation. What do I mean by that? Let's talk about that and we'll demonstrate that. Okay. So here's kind of a, a circuit diagram of what that probe looks like. I've got the probe tip, I've got the ground clip, I've got this 9 mega ohm resistor. Now I've got some capacitance from the coax connection, I just kind of modeled it right here, say that there might be you know, 80, 90, 100 picofarads of the capacitance of the, the cable. And then the scope itself has got the one mega ohm input impedance, and then the input capacitance of the scope, you know, 15 picofarads, 20 picofarads. Now what happens is if, if we just ignored this capacitor here for the moment, what we can see is that, okay, I've got nine mega ohms here feeding into one meg, plus I've got this input capacitance. Well, as the frequency goes up, this capacitor here is going to start being a lower impedance than that, that one mega ohm here. So I now have an RC filter, a 9 mega ohm and 15 picofarad RC low pass filter, right? So I just rolled my amplitude off, it's a low pass filter. So I, I got rid of the input capacitance here, but now I'm rolling off over here. Why did I do that? Okay. So the way we get around that is we put a compensation capacitor around that 9 mega ohm resistor. Okay. So now we've got a 10 to 1 ratio, or 9 to 1 ratio between these two to give me a 10x voltage divider. And then what we do is we adjust this capacitor so it's got that same 9 to 1 ratio. The other way around, but it's the same 9 to 1 ratio. So now at low frequencies, the, attenu the attenuation is dominated by these resistors. As the frequency goes up, 
both of these capacitors are going to start, their, their reactance is going to start coming down as the frequency goes up, but they're coming down at that same ratio. So now this is a capacitive voltage divider that's still 10x. Okay, so I've got a 10x voltage divider at low frequency with the resistors, a 10x voltage divider at higher frequencies with the capacitors. And by adjusting this capacitor rate, we can get that ratio right for whatever that scope capacitance is. Works great. That extended our frequency response. It all worked. Of course, you know, the input impedance will drop as the frequency goes up. You can't get around that. But now at least we've made it flat. We don't have a low pass filter anymore. But the problem is not, not all scopes have got the same input capacitance. Okay? Some scopes have got 25 picofarads input capacitance, some have 10, some have 15. So I can't just put a fixed resistor in. Capacitor. Okay. I'm sorry? Capacitor. Yeah, thank you. We gotta listen to what I mean, not what I say. <laughs> so, so, so that capacitor's got to be adjusted. Okay, now how do we adjust that? Well, if you've ever looked at some of these probes, sometimes on the probe body itself, there'll be a little screw hole for a little trimmer, or sometimes on the body of the, the probe itself, there's a little screw hole for the trimmer, and that basically is to adjust that capacitor. All right, and we adjust it to flatten out the frequency response. How do we do that? On the front of the scope, you'll often see a scope calibrator or scope compensation signal. And what it is is a relatively low frequency square wave, about a kilohertz square wave. Now think about a square wave signal at a kilohertz. It's got energy at a kilohertz, at three kilohertz, at five kilohertz, at seven kilohertz, all the way up the chain. The faster the rise of full time, the higher frequency components in that. So it's effectively a broadband signal. Okay, and, and uh, what we can do is adjust essentially that capacitor to adjust the response to that square wave. If, the, if this capacitor were too small, then this is going to look like a, a low pass filter. And the waveform is going to look like this. Like we're, we're filtering off the high, the high speed edges. Right? If that capacitor were too big, that means that we're going to emphasize the high frequency components and we're going to get overshoot. So what we do is simply connect the probe up and adjust that capacitor to make a perfect looking square wave. Let's actually go do that. Let's switch over to this camera here so that not everybody can see up here. So let's see if this works. Uh, 13. <laughs> so I got the camera here. Let's uh, see if that pops up on here. One, two, three. Okay. Do, I, do, you, do anything to turn this? There we go. There we go. All right, let's see. So not perfectly clear, not focused. Um, let's see if I can. <laughs> so that's exposure. And let's see, there's a focus thing here, but I'm not sure I can get this thing to focus better or not. Let's see. That's a little better. So you can kind of see what's going on. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's connect up this scope up here. Okay. The probe to the front end, and uh, the on this particular scope over here is my uh, comp, uh, scope calibrator or compensation signal, and uh, so I'll put uh, that channel on here, and let me adjust my scale here. Okay, and uh, so now I can actually see that square wave. This one is actually adjusted pretty well. Now, if you ever got these scopes, sometimes they, they always always come with a little screwdriver. But how many people kept it? <laughs> Okay. Mm. Right. <laughs> That's to adjust the scope, the probe. Because if you don't, you can have, you can be probing a signal at 10 megahertz, and it could be dramatically wrong because the, it's not compensated. So let's actually go take a look at what happens. If I stick this thing into the compensation hole here, I just made that capacitor too small. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now if I, if I probed a 10 megahertz signal, it would be smaller in amplitude than it really was. <clears throat> okay. If I adjust it the other way, I can see it overshoot. So you get it adjusted just right, right about there. Now that scope, now that probe is compensated for that scope. If I move that probe to a different scope, so I might have to do that again. How many people compensate their probes on a regular basis? I used to have all my all my probes stayed with the scope. Well, there you go. Compensate on once and you're done. And that's it. Yeah. And what's nice is some of the newer digital scopes. Um, and some of the newer probes 
we'll all uh, do the compensation automatically. Okay. Well, I don't know if you have to connect it up, but you can run the compensation. You don't dial the number anymore. And the compensation is actually stored in the scope channel. So when I connect that probe up, it knows, oh, this is probe number whatever. And that's how it's going to be compensated. Okay. Let me uh, get my probe connected. So that's what we're doing when we're adjusting the compensation on a scope probe, okay, is to adjust that capacitor. Yeah. There we go. All right. So what we're doing is matching and getting that ratio right between those two capacitors. Okay. Very important thing to do that almost nobody remembers to do. <laughs> but it's a really good thing to remember to do. It's an SOP for us at the client. Yep, yeah, of course. So anybody's doing any calibrated work, it's definitely something you have to do. Okay. So another mode that you can use a scope in is what's called XY mode. We've, we've been talking up to this point about using scopes where the sweep is controlled by the scope, the X position of the trace controlled by the horizontal sweep oscillator. You could use another input to drive that input. Okay, and basically turn the scope into an X, uh, an etch a sketch, uh, moving the beam back and forth oh, this from one. two different signals. Um, so, for example, if I drive the same signal into both inputs, right? That means that I'm going to be driving the, the beam to the left or right or up or down at the same rate. So, the exact same signal into both things, I get a diagonal line, right? Because I move it X and Y the same amount. If I made a phase shift between those signals then I can create circles and ellipses and things like that, like that first row right here. If there's a frequency difference, like a one to two frequency ratio, then I'll loop around and things like that. So these are called Lissajou patterns. You can, it, it can be used for measuring phase shift and things like that. Um, this picture right here, something I, I remember doing when I was back in high school, messing around with a scope. And yeah, it was I would take the left channel and the right channel from my Stereo, <laughs> right? Put it on channel one and channel two to go to X, Y mode. And if you're in mono, you get a flat, a, a dag and a line. But if you're in stereo, you'd actually get kind of a fuzz like this because you get the stereo separation left and right. We're doing the same thing. So you know, you look at Pink Floyd, uh, what you did. So the lights off in the room, you had that point. That's what you did. But you were a geek like me. But uh, so there's lots of other things you can use with X, Y mode. You know, one example is like you know, making curve tracer. I've got a video up that shows how to make and use what's called an octopus, which is a very basic single trace curve tracer. Uh, so you can actually look at voltage and current characteristics like through a diode or something like that. Um, maybe frequency response curves, sweeping an IF that we're receiving. Okay, so if we have a function generator or a sweep generator that sweeps from one frequency to another, we apply that to our device under test. Okay, so we're sweeping the frequency through an IF. And then oftentimes they'll give you a ramp voltage that is proportional to where the frequency is. So we apply that to the, the x-axis input of the scope, the output of the y, we can actually trace out the frequency response of a filter. Okay, you can see the frequency is low and getting higher and higher and higher. So, so here's a like a bandpass filter with that IF filter being swept okay, using the scope. Uh, one use of, of doing uh, X, Y, mode. The controls on these scopes will typically be laid out in somewhat logical fashion. You know, here's a, an old analog uh, type scope that's got vertical controls channel one and two, the triggering controls down here, notice all the mounts up pushed all the way to the top. Okay. Horizontal controls and then the triggering for the beat time base, some of the display controls here. So here's Vertical control for channel one, vertical for channel two, horizontal controls, trigger controls. All kind of, and they're all kind of labeled in little boxes around them. So you have vertical section, there's horizontal section, here's trigger section. So once you start looking at it, it's not just an array of buttons anymore. Now you can kind of see what functions are where. So the digital scope layouts are typically a little bit simpler because a lot of things might be handled through menus. There won't be as many buttons on the screen 
but those would be other you know, measurement functions you could bring up, but things will bring up some on-screen menus. But you'll typically still have, you know, some, most of the scopes will still have per channel controls for some of the basic things. You know, the vertical scale, vertical position, things like that. I want to look for, and now that if you don't have a scope, maybe now you want one, what do I go look for? So on the old analog CRT-based scopes, you know, Tektronix has been the leader for you know, six, more than 65 years. You really almost can't ever go wrong with a, an older analog, older analog Tektronix scope. HP made some really nice analog scopes as well. And then some of the other manufacturers you'll see is like Philips or Hamag, Leader, uh, Hitachi. You know, there'll be a number of other ones that are out there. And I would call those kind of more second tier brands, but they work, they're serviceable, they work well, okay? If you are looking at digital scopes, obviously Tektronix, Agile, and LaCroix are kind of the big three. Uh, Rival is probably the the only jewel, the only real jewel in the in the Far Eastern, you know, Chinese crowd of manufacturers that are making scopes. There's a lot of other you know, kind of Far East scopes, uh, Owan and Siglint, and there's a whole host of other manufacturers that I, I think are not probably not as good as some of these others. Yeah. Are the probes designated an analog probe or a digital probe? No, typically the only designation on the probe will be its bandwidth. You might get a 50 megahertz probe or a 100 megahertz probe. So you could use you probe. could use any probe with any scope. Almost. Okay. So if you use the probe that's only rated for 50 megahertz on a 200 megahertz scope, the probe is going to limit the bandwidth. Right. Okay. But you can you can do the opposite. The only thing you've got to worry about is you got that compensation capacity, right? You have to be sure that the, the particular probe has got enough range to compensate for the input capacitance of your scope. Okay, so a very wide band probe, like a 200 megahertz probe or a 500 megahertz probe, might not have enough compensation range to operate on a, a low speed scope that's got a 30 picofarad input capacitance. It might not have enough compensation range to properly adjust the probe. That's the only thing you got to worry about. But otherwise, it doesn't matter. Make sense? Okay. So. Basically, a scope gives you a way of viewing how voltage changes over time. Fundamental controls are controlling the vertical uh, sensitivity, the horizontal sweep speed, and how we trigger the sweep. Okay. Uh, analog and digital scopes, you got a lot more functionality in the digital scopes. You know, digital scopes these days are upwards of you know, 70 gigahertz of bandwidth, so it's pretty crazy. Okay. So let's look at how we can use these in Hamshack. Okay. I do have a number of videos up that, that show a lot of these things. I'll go through two examples here, two or three examples here. You know, transmit signal monitor is the first obvious one, right? Like the old station monitors, if anybody's got an old S Kenwood SM220 or was it the ASU YO301 or I think it was called, I forget now. You actually can look at the RF envelope of your RF output, okay? So you can look to see if you're flat topping, distorting, things like that, getting proper modulation depth on AM. That's one way to do it. You do the same type of thing to like properly adjust the levels when you're doing PSK31, so you're not overdriving, that kind of thing. You can look at things like amplifier linearity by doing trapezoidal waveforms. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, be able to measure some various characteristics of coax, how long a piece of coax is, what its impedance is. I'm going to do that example here. And of course, if you're home brewing circuits, debugging circuits, fixing things, they've got some obvious examples of being able to use and This is just a small example of various ways we can use scope and the ham shaft. So let's actually go do a couple of these. Okay. Switch back over to the document camera here. So maybe the first thing we'll do is look at the station monitor example. Okay. All right, so we're going to take my probe off of here. And uh, I'll describe what I've got, uh, got sitting here. So I got a, uh, a little ICOM 703 HF rate here. Its output is coming through this guy right here, which is an RF sampler. Okay. Uh, basically, the RF is coming in, going back out, and into a dummy loop. Okay. Uh, and then a small piece of that signal is being sampled off and going into the scope. Okay. So it's just kind of a it's kind of like a probe for RF. Okay. You can build these things. Here's one that I picked up on eBay a couple years ago for about 20 bucks. Basically, the RF goes through this path down here at the bottom, and then this guy is kind of a, an adjustable plunger that adjusts the coupling into that port that you can bring into a scope or a spectrum analyzer or a frequency counter. And it's a real nice, easy way to couple RF signal in. Even the better way is how many of you guys use a, a tuner in the shop? Okay. 
and that tuner's got multiple antenna positions, right? How many are you using all of them? Are you using all the positions? I wasn't. I got one for the gun load, one for an antenna, other ones that are not being used. What you can do is connect the scope up to one of the unused inputs. Now don't switch, don't transmit into the scope, transmit into your normal antenna or your dummy load, but there's enough coupling inside the box of the tuner to get some signal out of that unused port. So you just you got an RF sample right in your shack, you didn't know it. Hmm. Okay? And it works well. It works really well. So this, so what we can do is if I so with this setup here, I've got the rig set up for, for side pan. And if I uh, let me adjust the uh, signal level here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. You can actually see the you know, modulation of my RF. I'm going to turn the intensity up here. It'll be easier to see. So you can actually see the RF envelope. You know of you know what I'm talking. So you can actually see where it's limiting. If I talk really loud, you see the ALC is kind of limiting the power. And if, I, if I'm not, if I talk out here, you know now I'm getting a bit, you know not doing as much compression. So it, it's a real nice way of just being able to look at the your RF modulation, see if your flat toppings and things like that. If I switch over to AM, okay, I can see the carrier, okay, and now I can actually see the modulation depth. When I talk really loud, you can see it's kind of almost clipping there in the middle and leveling at the top. Okay, it's kind of over mod it's kind of, kind of getting as close to 100% modulation as I can get, but a lot of compression and distortion where I look a little bit cleaner here. If I have very little uh, amplitude modulation, a little microphone way out here, I'm not getting as much modulation there. So, I mean, it's a real simple way. And if I speed this up here a little bit, it's easier to see on the camera. You know, uh, you, wanna, you, you play with the horizontal controls. You know, a millisecond or two milliseconds of division is typically good for looking at uh, the voice patterns. Yeah, so, that's one real obvious use for a scope and a shack. And it's cool. So, so you know, it's nice to have. Now you can also build a, um, an amplitude detector, okay, um, to basically just to AM demodulate the signal. Uh, I've actually got that here as well. I'm going, I'm going to put that on another channel here. I'm going to put that channel on. So now, uh, let's see. I'm turning. I'm going to put it on the right side. Oh, I'm going to put it on the other side. Let's go over here. So with this one here, we have our test volume down here. So this one is just following the envelope, the positive envelope, or the peak power. Okay. And this might be more useful for looking at AM, but it's just following the peak power of the signal. So it's more of an amplitude detector. Now if I put both of those on at the same time, you can actually see, you really can't tell up there, but you can probably tell on the screen here that you know, I've got this brighter trace that's kind of tracing the top of the envelope of the RF signal. Now what you might do is actually use a combination of these two things in X, Y mode. So what you might do is take the detected output of your exciter and drive X with that. Okay? And then take the RF output of the amplifier and drive Y with that. And what that will do is create a trapezoid pattern. Okay? And uh, it's not going to show up really great here, but I'll do it. So I'll put the scope in X, Y mode, and I can actually see the trapezoid. Okay. I can turn off channel one. You actually see that trapezoid pattern creating kind of a wedge, a triangle. And you can tell by looking at that, if the thing levels off at the ends, then you might be clipping. You know, we can actually you know, get a good measure of linearity of the amplifier you know, by doing that. In this case, it's going to be perfect because there's no amplifier here. There's nothing. I'm measuring the same signal both ways. If I switch back to AM mode, okay, I can see the carrier, and now I can see my modulation around that carrier. Okay. Again, looking for linearity, I can see I'm doing, I got about half the voltage for the carrier, so uh, about a quarter of the power, so the power of the carrier, you can see that. So it just gives you a way of being able to look at that kind of thing. So basically, uh, if I haven't used my, my linear quite a while, and I want to go see if there's any problems I need with the tubes, and the capacitors, etc., mm -hmm. I can simply put uh, a scope on that, yeah. and by the pattern tell me, is this thing Still work, or yeah. do I have to change? Uh, yeah, you can start off by just looking at the RF envelope of it to okay. see if it's clipping or doing anything weird. And you can do that with just that unused port on the on the on the tuner, that type of thing. Okay. And then if things look look weird, then you're gonna look to see if it's a linearity problem, do that kind of thing. Mm. Okay. When you say when you say unused um, port on your antenna tuner, is that an input or output port? And typically what like an import port? Usually uh, an antenna port. Usually about you know four four antenna connections. You got to switch to pick which one. 
pick one that you're not using, okay? Connect up the scope to that. And then transmit into your dummy load or transmit into your antenna. And there's enough coupling in the box to get enough leakage into that port to be able to see it. Just all transmit into your scope because you can do that once and let the smoke out. Send it on the cigar. Right? So, um, so that gives you an idea. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about how we might use this to make some measurements on coax. Okay. So let me get rid of that guy, get rid of this guy. So I got a hunk of coax here. You know, I can read on the jacket, you know, that it's, you know, it's RG8, so I know it's 50 ohms, I know its velocity factor is about 66%, but I don't want to uncoil this thing and measure how long it is. Okay. Maybe this coax is packed up to a tower somewhere. Maybe I got a break in it somewhere. Mm -hmm. I need to find out where that break is. You can do that with a scope. Mm -hmm. okay. But we are going to need to put some signal into it. Okay. And what we'll do is what's called time domain reflectometry, TDR. And what we're going to do is launch a pulse into, the, into this. Okay. Because you know, this, our radio waves have got a propagation speed, right? 300,000 meters, 300 million meters a second. Okay, in free space, it's 66% of that in coax, right? Or typical coax, 66% velocity factor. So let's translate that back a little bit. You work the numbers, it winds up being about 7.78 inches every nanosecond. So in one nanosecond, okay, one one, hundred, one one billionth of a second, we move about almost eight inches. Okay, so there's a finite propagation delay. So we can actually use that to our advantage. So what I can do is take a, a pulse, let's uh, switch over to this guy here, let's speed this up. So I've got a pulse coming out of my little pulse generator. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll launch that pulse into this cable. Now the cable is open at the other end. So looking into the cable, instantaneously it looks like 50 ohms. That's 50 ohm cable. Mm. All right. So that the, the pulse is going to see 50 ohms. Until it gets all the way to the end, it's like, boom, it doesn't see 50 ohms anymore. The signal reflects back. And then it reflects back and adds up with the signal that's going in the other direction. Let's look at what that looks like. We can actually use that to our advantage. So if I connect, I've got the, um, the pulse generator connected up to a T. So now if I connect up the other end of the T to my coax, ooh, look at that. See that little step in the waveform? Yeah. Okay. So what we're looking at there, let me move this down there. What we're looking at is, one more step. And let's move this over. So what we're looking at here is the pulse comes on. It sees 50 ohms. So the pulse comes out of the pulse generator, comes up to the scope input, and it's, 50, it's coming from 50 ohm coax. It sees 50 ohm coax. So, it's, so that's the level it's set. So the generator's got a 50 ohm output. Right? So there's a, there's a 2 to 1 voltage divider between this, the generator and the coax. Okay? So the, the, the signal travels happily all the way down the other end of the coax, hits the end, reflects back. And then when it comes back, it gets back to here again. That reflection adds up with the signal that's going the other way. And we get the second step in the waveform. So this time period right here, from here to here, is the round trip delay through the coax. Hmm. Okay. So now, OK, I know the round trip delay. Well, on this scope, we can actually look and read how many nanoseconds per division. You can't really see it here. It's not focused, but it says 20 nanoseconds of division. I can actually put cursors on this scope to actually measure that. Okay. So it's about 76 nanoseconds. So it took 76 nanoseconds for the signal to enter into the cable, hit the end, and come out. All right. So if I, okay, I got 76 nanoseconds. What does that mean? So 76 nanoseconds, and I multiply that by 7.78 seconds or you know inches per nanosecond. That'll give me about 76 inches. 75, 76 inches, something like that. I forget the number down on my head. I did these the other night. But then, okay, so the, oh, it gives me no, okay, 500 some odd inches. If I divide that by two, because that's a round trip delay, I only want the one delay. So I divide that by two, divide that by 12, okay, it gives me about 20, and it gives me about 25 feet. 25 feet of cable. Okay, now I know. Now, if this was cable running up the coax, running up a tower, you might say, now I know the break is that far up the tower. Okay? Or you go the other way. Say you knew the 
the length mm -hmm. of the coax. If you didn't know the, was the velocity factor? Exactly. You and then you go the other way around. The way around. Now you know what the sex of the coax is. Exactly right. Exactly right. So there's one way to measure that. Now let's say, let's say I, I presume this is 50 ohm coax, but maybe I didn't know what it was. Okay. Um, if I've got access to the end of it, I can do something like this. There's a little, P, little BNC connector with a little trim pot attached to it. Okay, so it's an adjustable termination. Okay, so if I connect this up to the other end, so I get out of the way so people can see. So if I adjust this, I can actually change. And uh, you can actually see, I can actually change the magnitude of that reflection by changing the impedance at the end of the coax. So there the, imp the impedance is high, higher than 50 ohms. There it's lower than 50 ohms. And there it's matching the impedance of the coax. So now I can take this thing out, measure its resistance, now I know the impedance of the coax. So basically, if somebody gives me a, uh, a piece of uh, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, that I want to use for my, uh, my shaft. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's 50 ohms, I don't know what the velocity factor, etc. I can put the thing on the scope yep. and pretty much know how long the thing is, yep. whether it's 50 ohms or 72 ohms, yep. what the velocity factor is, are there any breaks in it or deterioration, right. everything there is to know about that coax. Well, well, at least the major, the major, oh, the major factor, thing. Sure. Well, yeah. Now all you need is a, a, a pulse generator that's got some fairly fast edges. Remember, we're, we're measuring distances here in the tens of nanoseconds. So the rise time of that pulse generator needs to be you know, probably less than 10 nanoseconds, 5 nanoseconds, something like that. Now, I show in another video that I have how to build a very fast pulse generator with like 2 nanosecond edges for like 3 bucks. Mm. Okay, just a little oscillator. You just go build one. Could, could you use the calibrate feature on your scope? That's a great question. And the answer is most times no, because the rise time of that isn't going to be fast enough. So typically fairly slow rising and falling edges. However, a lot of the scopes will have a gate or trigger output out of the back. And that's sometimes fast enough. So just with the scope itself and its own trigger output might be fast enough to make that measurement. And what happens if you have an antenna on the other one? Well, again, yeah, it's going to depend on what the impedance of that, that antenna is. Right? It's like that cap. Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. I, I'm not, pardon me, but this question may seem simple to some people, but I'm, I'm I'm a little new to this, and I'm studying for the extra, yeah. and the technical end is driving me nuts. But what you just did to match up the impedance, yeah. now if you were an antenna manufacturer like Alpha Delta, uh -huh. you could use an oscilloscope to make sure like you get 50 ohms to match the cable? Yeah, there are better tools for doing it. Oh, but, okay. Okay, but you but, certainly could do that. Oftentimes you'd be using a, you know, a spectrum analyzer or a tracking generator or a network, or what's called a network analyzer. Okay. Those manufacturers will have those tools. But most of us hands will not. Okay, but I guess my point was beyond that, beyond the oscilloscope, was that that was the general principle. Yes. You were, okay, got yeah. it. In got fact, it. What I, I do have another video up that talks about how to use the scope to aid you in tuning an antenna. Okay. And what I do is I build a little resistive bridge, okay, um, that is all 50 ohms except for the antenna. Okay, and then we can probe that. And we can actually look at the voltage across the 50 ohm part of the bridge and that. And as you adjust your antenna tuner, you can actually see the phase change and the amplitude change and, and get everything all lined up, and that's when you match. So you can actually visually see what your, your tuner is doing. It's pretty cool. Okay. So let's look at another way to do this. Okay, We just use the scope with one way to kind of measure the length of the coax. There's another way to do it, too. So you think about when you've got a, a piece of coax, Okay. There's, there's a kind of a magical thing that happens at a quarter when the coax is a quarter wavelength long, okay, at a, at a given frequency. Um, so what happens is that if you have a piece of coax that's exactly a quarter wavelength long for a given frequency, the impedance inverts. The impedance that's at the loop looks opposite at the other end. So, for example, if I've got a piece of quarter wavelength long coax that is open circuited at the end, at that frequency, it looks like a short. Okay. If, I have, if I short the other end of that quarter wave of coax, it looks like an open. You get that inverse. That's right. weird. It's weird. And then, and then another quarter wave of later inverts again. So if, so if you make a piece of coax that's exactly a half wave 
the impedance looking into that coax will be equal to whatever load impedance is, whatever it is, if you're a half wavelength wall. Right? One K ohm, it looks like one K ohm. Doesn't matter that it's 50 ohm coax, it looks like one K ohm to get in there. And if you need those things to be exact, such as if you're doing a steerable already, mm -hmm. yeah, you can, that's, you, that's a way to do it. So let me show you how we do that, how we make those measurements. So I'm going to take, I'm going to make this an open circuit now. Okay, we're back to that open circuit situation. Let me take these cursors off of the scope. Okay, I'm going to switch from a uh, square wave to a sine wave. Let's kind of uh, bring that down. So I've got a sine wave here at one megahertz going into this, and so I'm doing the same thing. I'm launching it in. It's going past the input of the scope down the coax. I'm getting a reflection back. Okay. But because I get a reflection, I'm setting up a standing wave, right? Because it's not, not matched. So I've got SWR on the line. But we're going to take advantage of the fact that if I adjust the frequency to the point where the signal gets squashed, that means the signal's getting shorted out. So if I adjust the frequency till the signal goes away, I just found the frequency at which that coax is a quarter wavelength long. Okay? So let's go over here and adjust that. We need that. Let me go adjust frequency. Let me come over here so we can see what's going on. So let me bring that frequency up. See, see, see frequency's going down, frequency's going up. As the frequency goes up, look, the amplitude start to come down, coming down, coming down, and then it goes back up. There was a null in there. So if I go find that null, right about there, it's about 6.6, 6.5 megahertz. So this piece of coax is a quarter wavelength long at 6.5 megahertz. Let's figure out the length, right? 300 divided by 6.5 is about 46 meters. Okay. So if I divide that by four, because it's a quarter wavelength long, that's a you know a little over 11, 11 and a half meters. Okay. A little 11 and a half meters multiplied by 66, so 66 percent velocity factor. Okay, that's about seven, seven point something meters. Okay. Multiply that by 3.28 to get feet, that's about 25 feet. Mm -hmm. That signal generator you have there, is that the second neatest thing you can have in our shack? <laughs> yeah, any kind of signal generator is a nice thing to have in the shack. Now, of course, you could be doing this with a transmitter, you could be doing it with a little, little DDS signal generator, you know, DDS chip from uh, powered up by an Arduino, lots of different ways of doing signal generators, but you want a way of measuring the frequency of that. Yes? Um, again, it's a simple question, but they tell you that all coax has loss. Yes. Now, what you just said about like the signal inversion at the, relative to the frequency, are you are you implying that that the signal loss over the length of the coax isn't even? Does the, the inversion have something to do with the? It, it really is kind of separate from the loss. And okay. If you think about the loss, you typically talk about. You know, maybe, especially at HF, coax is going to have, you know, maybe a few dB in 100 feet. Right. Okay. Which is relatively small compared to, you know, this huge null that I just saw. Okay. So, the, yeah, there's loss on here, but, you know, especially for this coax, when you get longer pieces of coax, the core wavelength frequency is going to be lower. Right. So, you're going to be in less loss. Right. So, when you're using this technique, Generally, the loss isn't going to enter into it unless you're trying, unless you've got a really short length. Where they, you know, but then again, it's a short length, so there's not as much loss. So it's a pretty interesting technique. You, you go start a little frequency, you work your way up until you find that first null. Now you just found the quarter wavelength frequency of that first thing and just calculate back out. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate that. So, so there's lots of interesting ways of using the scope in the shack. Okay, to look at various things. Um, you know, connect up your transmitter, understand what your transmitter's doing. You know, maybe adjust your PSK31 waveforms, do some messing around here. I've got a couple of examples of other, you know, videos that I've done that talk about, um, you know, like I said, tuning your antenna and watching the effect of an antenna tuner you know, with, with a scope, looking at the phase shift that happens, things like that. I also did a pretty good video that talks about termination 50 ohms and why if you not terminate 50 ohms you get reflections, what they look like. And then how a standing wave is actually set up. I got a nice visual on that as well. So mm -hmm. lots of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. but that's kind of what I had. I know we, we took uh, you know quite a bit of time here, yeah. but I certainly appreciate you know you guys and hope you got something out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do have one. Actually what I'll do is I'll give you
Y'all got Elms. All right. Thank